Welcome aboard Frank's Magic Bus. For the next two hours, Frank Welch takes you on a musical journey with some of the best deep tracks of classic rock history. You'll hear this week's featured artist and a whole lot more. Now, without further ado, Frank Welch. And welcome to a Deep Purple special on Frank's Magic Bus. And my special guest is going to be Deep Purple lead singer Ian Gillen, telling some very cool stories about their 2013 release and getting back together and doing that album in Nashville about the legendary days of the early 70s. He'll play Smoke on the Water. He'll tell the fascinating true story behind that song with the burning of that casino in Montrose, Switzerland and seeing Smoke on the Water and the Machine Head album and all that good stuff. Deep Purple was formed in Britain back in 1968 with Rod Evans as lead singer. In fact, he sang Hush, their first big top ten hit in the USA. In fact, early on there, in the first year or two, they were bigger in the USA than they were in Britain. Then came Ian Gillen replacing Rod as lead singer back in 1969. They hit that very cool stretch of fantastic albums like In Rock, Fireball, and of course the epic Machine Head back in 1972, which had Smoke on the Water and several other great radio tunes, too. The Live Made in Japan 2. Deep Purple at their best was Ian Gillen on vocals, the late John Lord on organ, Ian Pace on drums, Roger Glover on bass, the legendary Richie Blackmore on guitar, but Richie exited by 1974 to form his own band Rainbow. Deep Purple with pretty good release for 2013, recorded in Nashville, called Now What? Let's welcome Deep Purple lead singer Ian Gillen to Frank's Magic Bus. Are you in uh, England today, by the way? I'm in Portugal at the moment. I've got a place down in the Algarve in the south of Portugal. I come here to do a bit of writing and relaxing down again, so spending a few days before I go back on the road. The I saw e- the name of your magic bus. You know, I, that's one of the miracles in my life is the magic bus story. If you ever have the time, go to gillen.com and put in the search engine the magic bus, and uh, you, you might find it interesting. Well, does it have to do with a Who song or something else? No, no, it's to do with when I was a kid, and it's this bus that used to appear. My dad used to know exactly when it would come around the corner, but it was a miracle. Uh, but it's a good story. <laughs> I will do that. I'll check that out. Well, I got the EP with All the Time in the World and Hell to Pay. All right. And uh, I'll tell you what, I like both of these songs. Now, the album is called Now What? with a question mark. What is significant about that? A new sound you want to take Deep Purple to? <laughs> well, as I said, I, I said to the guy at the record label, you know, when he asked me the same question, I said, look, it's been about seven or eight years since the last record, Rapture of the Deep. We've been happily, blissfully touring away ever since then, and then the phone rang. Now what? And it was like pressure from all We had no intention of making another record. I think we could have gone another seven years, but uh, we were getting a poke from all directions, and uh, suddenly we realized the management, fans, promoters, everyone saying, come on, it's about that time. And when Bob Ezrin came on board, uh, it all started to make sense because we triggered a little idea that we would get back to the way we used to write and the way we used to arrange things back in 69 to 73, and the first three albums I did with Deep Purple, um, there were only seven tracks on each record, and uh, there was no uh, deference given to time or anything else. We just followed our noses with the arrangements, and uh, I think it was, the music was a lot freer until later you become more conditioned and uh, into that sort of, uh, you know, the, there's so many minutes per song and all that sort of thing. So uh, I think, uh, and they were song-driven, but this is musically driven, and it's, I mean, I'm hanging on for dear life. I, it's like climbing on a wild horse and trying in some way to steer a direction with with no luck at all it was a fantastic experience and uh, great to go back to working that way well you talk about those days uh, the early days of uh, deep purple like 69 to 73 uh, just last week i played child in time and it is mm-hmm. so refreshing to be able to still play that i mean i i have a pretty good leeway here i can play all the deeper stuff and the older cool. longer songs and uh, lazy and stuff like that uh, one thing i noticed in uh, like the one song all the time in the world. Uh, you're recognizable as the singer of Deep Purple, and you can hear the organ in there, too. Uh, it sounds like Deep Purple, but, and this might be Bob Ezrin, it might be doing this album where you did it, but I hear a little twang of almost kind of a little hint of Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers in this thing. It's kind of got a good, uh, lively sound to it. Well, the sound is great. I think uh, one, the one thing I can say, I mean, obviously I can't, talk about the music that's too subjective but uh the uh in evaluating it anyway but uh the sound for me 
is uh, unbelievable. I've, I've never been 100% happy with the sound of any of our studio records. And this, for me, is just brilliant. It's head and shoulders above anything we've ever done in the sound department. And Ian, when did you first realize how much you really loved this Now What album, as far as the sound? Well, the first time I heard uh, a playback in the studio of uh, just a uh, sound check, I thought, oh my God, this is amazing, because... The distinctive sound of the guitar and organ is very much, along with the rhythm section, the cornerstone of the sound of Deep Purple. And uh, that's the identity of the band, apart from the voice. And I think uh, I could hear it so clearly. And yet it had more power. Because of the guitar and the keyboard, they overlap on the sound spectrum quite a lot. And so to get that degree of separation is quite tricky. So I, I was wiped away. I thought it was wonderful. It does have such a fresh sound to it. Now, you recorded this thing in some place pretty interesting and kind of different, didn't you? In Nashville. You guys had never recorded there before, right? No, been there a few times. And, uh, boy, it is a music city. It's vibrant. It was, it was very good in the, in the writing session. I mean, we, no one brings any music to a Deep Purple session. It's just uh, we make it up as we go along. And... Um, but the, the, just even the writing session was great in a rehearsal complex where bands coming and going and you could hear music as every door was opened and shut and bands rehearsing for their gigs that night, bands rehearsing for songwriting, bands auditioning. <laughs> it was amazing and uh, the standard was so high. There's so many great musicians there and uh, so it was electric. Plus the temperature was 110 degrees for the whole time we were there. Oh, jeez. You know, all these things have an effect on the music. They all... Um, an album, every album in history, really, is a, generally is, is a reflection of, of the period during which the songs were written and recorded. And I, I think uh, that pretty much shows in the, on this record, too. It's, uh, yeah, it was a nice place to be. And, of course, Bob, Bob Ezrin lives in Nashville, and uh, so he had all his um, you know, people there and the, the facilities. Everything was totally professional. We, we, we have spent many, many years and many, many albums recording in barns and stables and caves and <laughs> caravans and whatever. And uh, so it was, it was great to get back into the studio. Well, you know, Bob Ezrin, uh, such a famous uh, legendary producer. He, he did a Destroyer from Kiss. He worked on The Wall, uh, Alice Cooper, uh, Billion Dollar Babies and stuff like that. Uh, was mm -hmm. this the first time that you would work with Bob Ezrin as a producer? Yeah, first time we worked with him. Absolutely. I mean, what impressed me was his musical musical knowledge. I mean, it's not just his pop music, but he's great. He, he's very erudite in, in musical direction with regards to uh, classical music particularly, which is a great connection with Deep Purple, of course, because there's an awful lot of orchestral-style composition within the band. And uh, so he's... Uh, I mean, we went to see the, the Nashville Symphony with him one evening and because uh, he's a sponsor of the orchestra, and it was... Uh, it was great to have uh, musical connections in that, so nothing really had to be um, spoken about. It was all understood. He understands everything from jazz, classical to rock, you know. Well, I think he played piano on that big hit by Kiss, Beth, I think. I had heard that one yes, time. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, that whole Nashville feel and Nashville sound, and like you mentioned, the heat when you're recording in Nashville and how busy it is. Um, I don't think you could help not get a little tinge of that kind of southern warmth kind of feel to it. Well, I, 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 I would never have dreamt of that, but I understand what you're saying. That's great. Hi, this is Ian Gillen of Deep Purple. You're rocking with Frank Welch. As we continue our one-on-one -on -one conversation with Deep Purple lead singer Ian Gillen. You mentioned seeing the Nashville Orchestra. Uh, no, I love the uh, Live in Mantra with an Orchestra DVD you guys just put out a couple oh, of years yeah. ago. That is fantastic. Now, how often does Deep Purple perform with an orchestra, and do you prefer it or not to just playing with a band? It's just it makes a change uh, every few years, really. I suppose every five years. Um, and it's normally a proposal that comes up from someone else about a specific idea for a show, and we go, well, are we going to rehearse them and whatever? Let's take them on the whole tour. So uh, it's been quite an experience from the Royal Philharmonic back in the early days when John was composing uh, concertos and things like that to the more recent style where the orchestra has augmented the band with uh, arrangements uh, written for the orchestra around the band rather than not, not exactly using them as a backing group but using them as an integral part of the band with uh, some pretty hot arrangements. It happens every now and again. We're doing, strangely enough, the Montreux Jazz Festival again this year. We're headlining that 
in July, and two, day, two days later, we're playing the, the Royal Opera House in London, uh, in Covent Garden. It's the first time a band has ever played there. We're doing two nights. Well, Quincy Jones is doing one night, and Deep Purple's doing the second night. And uh, so I'm looking forward to that. But we won't have an orchestra on those occasions, which is when you would expect it to happen. But uh, No kidding, yeah. I think we're, we're looking forward to some other kind of... Uh, add some other kind of uh, dimensions to the show, let's say, some guest performers maybe, I don't know. That is amazing. You know, these days when you go to see a Moody Blues concert, you, they pretty much almost always now use an orchestra, even if they use the host city's orchestra. But mm. you guys, it's just kind of an occasional thing with you guys, right? Yeah, I think uh, it can be restrictive because obviously most of the time they're playing from dots. But at the same time, when you get an orchestra trained up, we had the Frankfurt Philharmonic with us last time. They were amazing, absolutely incredible. So uh, they put a lot of their personal vibe into the show with the body movement and standing up and, you know, rocking. And so it, it was a lot more than the normal stayed monkey suits. And uh, yeah, every now and again, every now and again. But I think uh, we like the freedom without it because... Uh, Deep Purple is almost 50% of what we do is improvised, so uh, uh, you can get away from all that when you when you don't have an orchestra. Well, you had mentioned uh, uh, John Lord. Of course, it wasn't too long ago that he passed away. I'm sure you have a, so many fond memories of him. But uh, Don Airy, if you're going to have a guy you know, slip in there as an organ player and keyboard player, I mean, he's done stuff with, what, Sabbath and Rainbow and stuff. Uh, he's got to be a, a, a great replacement. John is amazing, absolutely incredible. When John left the band quite a while ago now, and uh, because he wanted to basically retire from touring, I think it was getting too much for him, and uh, he wanted to focus on uh, more orchestral compositions. Well, uh, it has to be said, for the last year prior to that, Don, John had been somewhat lacking in the inventiveness department on the stage. He would just sort of kind of turn up and look wonderful, and <laughs> put his shades on, and that wonderful... Uh, um, silhouette that he has and uh, when Don came in the dynamics were just awesome absolutely incredible 